Welcome, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to yet another Rebelway webinar. My name is Arun Bradesco, and I'll be your host for the evening. With us today is the Magic FX superstar, Hunter Williams. He's currently a senior FX artist at Luma Pictures and has worked on projects like Godzilla, Tomorrow War, Space Jam 2, Shang-Chi, Eternals, Loki, Hawkeye, and the list just continues. Uh, today, he will pull away the smoke and mirrors and show us how real magic is made. It's my pleasure to have you on the stream, Hunter. Thank you for the intro. Yeah, good to be here. Yes, cool. Well, before we actually jump into, you know, the core of the webinar, let's um, watch the promo one more time. Yes. Dude, so that, good. That song is so dramatic. It's so good. <laughs> like, this is actually the first time we use these cinematic kind of movie, triple A movie soundtracks. Usually we just use like dark blues and yeah. like rock music. And this is the first time we use something like that and it fits so well. I love it. <laughs> it's so cool. like that epic trailer music kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty, pretty much. Yeah. All right. So. Hunter, I have a question to start everything off. Um, yesterday, we talked about just a bit on how you started with the industry. And you were saying that not the, like you being an FX artist was not really planned. You were actually kind of working in the film industry, right? <clears throat> yeah, so I went, I went to school for film. Yeah. Um, and uh, I really was into photography and cinematography at first. Um, I just, you know, love the visuals, like the end end result, uh, and um, and yeah, I was working on. I, I did while I was in school. I was working on sets in New York. Like I worked on Orange is the New Black, just as like a PA, mm -hmm. um, and got to kind of experience some of the set life a little bit, which um, was really fun. And uh, yeah, it was, I mean, it was really long hours, which I think even now it's long hours. Um, you know, if you want it to be. And, but at least you're not traveling to and from a set, you know? Yeah. Like, uh, so you would, you would end the day and then you would have to get back home. So you ended up, at, you know, depending on your commute, it was just crazy. Um, yeah. And it was a very physical thing. You had to go and, uh, and be, get there and be present. But, but yeah, throughout school, I also started doing like some projects for a lot of friends and, uh, a lot of, you know, freelance work, just like through word of mouth and stuff or commercial and kind of fell uh, more in love with like that technical, like I could really geek out on like an After Effects template or something or like a Cinema 4D project. Um, and I just kind of fell in love with that, like to the, to the degree where even when I was doing a cinematography project in order, because, you know, you've got to get the lights and the crew and the location if you, um, you know, for, for some of those projects. So in order to like try to be as prepared as possible, I would like pre-light things in Cinema 4D and just yeah. mess around with it. Like, you know, CG allows you to just, you know, iterate very quickly and, you know, do different versions and try wacky things. Whereas like, 
on set, you have to actually go and walk five feet, get the light, unplug it, plug it into another outlet, bring it over, re, you know, reposition it. So it just becomes yeah. like very cumbersome to try different things, especially when you're like a student, like you want to try as much as possible, uh, you know, different looks and different, you know, arrangements. And, um, and so it just became like a, a really good outlet for, for me to just try as many things as I could. Um, so yeah, so I, I started out in Cinema 40, which uh, is a, an awesome tool. You mentioned that you also started out in Cinema 40. Dude, my, my path was exactly the same as yours. I studied, yeah. I actually wanted to be a film director. Yeah. And then I, from being a film director, I was on a lot of film sets and, you know, just as students, um, we were shooting a lot of movies, right? And yeah. I kind of fell in love with actually moving the camera, like operating the camera. So I, I was then kind of persuaded to become a director of photography. And that's what I did for a long time. Yeah. And I had the same problem. I, because, you know, in real life, you have to buy lights, you have to buy the camera, you have to yeah. buy expensive lenses. And then you're on a movie shoot or a commercial. And then, yeah, everything is so, <laughs> you have to move the lights. Everything is difficult. You need 10 you people. Like someone, <laughs> yeah. Someone's going to kick you out like a yeah. location at some point. So, you yeah. know, you can't stay there forever. And then like, you know, uh, I don't know, the um, another huge part of cinematography that like, I think is that it's hard to control, or I don't know. I, I don't know about big cinematography jobs. I never really got that far into it, but I would really? say that it's hard to control oftentimes if, unless you have a someone doing it, uh, like the set dressing, for example. Like, yeah. that's a huge part of the image you're getting is yeah. like the stuff, you know, in the scene uh, and or in the actual shot. So, um, like, you, you make it a really cool location and then, you know, blow your budget on the location and then, you know, get a couple lights, but then you can't actually color coordinate anything on set because you that would cost you know money to do so it yeah. just became a it, it became more of like a logistical nightmare to like do these kind of bigger projects of course you can always do like like i think there have been so many things i've seen online with cinematography where they didn't do very much uh in terms of that kind of stuff and it turned out great like if you're smart yeah. about it you could you could film it with your phone like i've seen some of that stuff which is really cool but and and the yeah. thing is, like, I really see that you came from that cinematography background in your work, like the way you present stuff, the way you showcase some of these elements um, is super cinematic. And I feel like a lot of people, <clears throat> when I get asked, you know, what should I put in my portfolio to get that first job in the industry? Or how does the showreel look like? Usually FX people don't put that extra care in present, presenting their work properly. And I, I can definitely see that in your work, you know, that you came from that different background and you kind of combined two skills. And I feel like that's super important. Yeah. Um, I mean, effects yeah. is like super like vague sometimes, you know, like you, you, you could be doing a lot of different things in effects. So it's not like just one discipline. It's kind of a combination of any disciplines. Mm, yeah. um, and, you know, I've heard of people comping their own effects, people lighting their own, you know, so there's just so many different things you could be doing uh, as an effects artist. Um, so yeah, so I feel like, be, I feel like some of the, some of the best effects stuff I've seen from students are where they tried different disciplines throughout that, you know, um, yeah. like when I was, so to finish uh, off where I, you know, how I got into it is I, in, in college, I started doing some internships and um, I ended up doing actually some, some of that freelance work, like I said, by word of mouth, but then also now I was starting to get like commercial work through like internships and stuff. And, um, and then, uh, a company up in, in Boston, commercial company, small commercial company, they, uh, reached out to me about potentially joining them as a staff visual effects artist and mm -hmm. like their only staff visual effects artist. So, um, I went there with. My After Effects and Cinema 4D, which is, they're awesome tools. I don't want anybody to take it the wrong way. They're like fantastic tools. And, uh, but, and I was doing like a lot of comp stuff, like a lot of like cleanup, you know, uh, just whatever they needed at the time. Uh, 
And then I was doing that for a while. And then I think there was a time where a pretty big project came up uh, where uh, needless to say, we were replacing cars with CG and I don't have any, pro any professional, you know, production experience at that time. Um, so I was just like looking up, I think for like two weeks, I just watched nuke tutorials online, like, anything I could get my hands on, uh, for hours and hours and hours and hours. And, um, that project went pretty well. And I think it was like a really fun experience. And, um, we got to hire some, some offsite freelancers that were like significantly better compers than myself. Mm. And they were able to even teach me some things, um, uh, about it, even though I was having to deal with kind of more client to, uh, to artist, you know, communication, and then also filling that role as a comper. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there was a couple of uh, shots where we really wanted to do like these really big, epic, cinematic, like destruction shots and stuff like that and have these extra elements. And uh, I went through all of the libraries, the stock libraries to find anything I could, could find to like comp in there. And nothing was ever like really like for some of the shots that we just couldn't find anything that was actually feeling right. So um, I kind of made a mental note during that project, like, oh, man, I should actually learn how to do simulation or something like that. So yeah. that in the future, we could we can use this skill um, and we can actually like make our own simulation for custom elements and stuff. Um, and that's how that's how I started uh, looking into Houdini. Um, yeah. It's yeah, I feel like that's a, the entry point for a lot of people, especially like, you know, I, I've actually seen quite a bit of um, like compers that end up in effects, you know, or, yeah. um, you know, and, and then that's also, I think, what like helps with like reels and stuff, especially um, is like coming at it from more of an end product perspective. Mm -hmm. um, like you can say, I want it to look like this um as a finished shot and then coming at it from that perspective instead of like uh you know there's like that i feel like it's like very common advice at this point in effects to be like well don't make the effects for every angle you know like block the camera in there try to make it for um you know uh, uh in a lot of the movements that i have in my personal work is uh are very simple camera moves for the most part, like, I feel like even in Hollywood, like they don't really do crazy. Cam I mean, they do in some mm -hmm. bigger films and stuff, but, um, for the most part, like you're not, it's hard to build a dolly that, that, that goes across, you know, thousands of feet, you know? So yeah. up yeah. until at least recently, they weren't doing these huge, crazy cameras that orbit throughout the scene and stuff. So, um, which I think, you know, if you look at it from that perspective and you create shots that, um, that you could see in a film, uh, when, even when you're devving stuff, like you're trying to create, um, real, uh, projects, I think even looking at it from that perspective at that point is good because ultimately yeah. as effects artists, we're doing things for shots. Um, and you know, I mean, maybe that's not always the case, but for the most part, at least it's the case. Yeah, uh, usually it's it's based on the shot. Yeah, make it look for from that camera. Yeah. Yeah, and you start, and you can always start like you know one of the things uh, that I think is important is you can start from a I don't have a specific shot in mind kind of way, but then there comes a point where you're doing things that are very um, specific, and you, and there's a line where you once you cross it, you're kind of in that like shot, you know, realm. And mm -hmm. it might be nice to put a camera down and, and not worry about every angle and kind of figure out what you can build into the tech versus what you can, uh, what maybe you'd have to be doing more shot work for. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So when you, when you jumped into Houdini for the first time, or let's say looking back now, what mistakes did you make learning Houdini and how would you go about it if you had to redo it again? I think yeah, it's funny. One of the mistakes that I think I made that hung me up for a long time <clears throat> is trying to understand things too much. Hmm. Like I, <laughs> that sounds kind of weird, but I think I, when I first got into um, like fluid 
simulation. I was like, I need to understand how this is working. Like, I don't understand, you know, I, it was hard for me to understand what like divergence was. So I was mm -hmm. like, oh man, I need to go and like look this up and really spend a lot of time on it. Um, which I think you don't need to do for sure. And I think it actually ended up preventing me from moving forward a little bit um, at first. Yeah. Because ultimately, like, you know, you want to you want to play around with things and, and play around with results and kind of in your mind come up with, you know, tip tips and tricks that you can use to to get mm -hmm. certain bugs. Um, but I will say looking back at it though, um, I don't regret it because I don't I'm by no means a expert on any of this stuff, but Mm -hmm. um, kind of knowing where you can, um, like what things you can exploit in like the solver, for example, to do certain other things, um, and really having a grasp on like, just generally what it's doing is like, has been very valuable, I think. Mm. Yeah. Um, and I see in, in your work, you have, your effects are more controlled. So like, for instance, a lot of the magic, like a lot of the effects that we're going to be going through in the magic workshop they're not simulated in the typical sense, right? Like a lot of them are procedurally made and more controlled. Yeah, I think, um, so I think that simulation is uh, really awesome. And I think one of the things actually going back to your last question about mistakes I've made hmm. is I think it's really easy to want to like, you know, when you're geeking out about these simulations and you're like really excited about building all this stuff in sim is you start trying to couple things like put things together that maybe shouldn't be put together in a sim like um things don't have to depend on other things and mm -hmm. it's actually better in uh at least when you're like either a client or yourself um you're thinking about um like all the notes that you have on your own shot your own work Mm -hmm. and um wanting to go back and and make an adjustment like it's a lot easier to do that if changing one thing in your sim doesn't just change everything else in your sim so mm -hmm. like you there is a, a certain layer or a certain amount of like layering you want to do with uh that makes it a lot easier to address things yeah and granted like big sims are great i like i'm the first to say like Whenever I see a big sim and, and something, I'm like, that's awesome. Like, I want to do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But oftentimes, I feel like there's, it's, it's simpler than you think it is. They're not, you know, um, yeah, they're just not simming, like, uh, where they just, you know, only do a couple parameters, and then you hit play, and then the sim just does everything else. Yeah. So um, building procedural tools that maybe don't even, uh, maybe for an effect that doesn't even need to sim is often, hmm. like, a really good place at least to start. And uh, also um, building tools and building procedural tools and animation where you get something looking really cool before it even goes into a sim. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of work, you know, in sourcing and stuff like that can really help. Um, yeah, getting the the feeling and the the timings right, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and yeah. that's that's another thing. Is like, there's if you look through like art stations stuff, there's all these really cool concepts for effects like there's like mm. of magic stuff and mm -hmm. really awesome stuff but um and some of them are animated but a lot of them aren't and so it's really hard like it's one thing to see the effect on a frame and it's the other one to see it move so a lot of the time you're think you're just trying to think of how does this effect move mm. um and you got to think about like you know that's where like reference comes in is and and not just like one reference like saying, oh, it could behave like this at first and then move into this and then really creating like a big portfolio of reference um, is uh, is pretty valuable for that kind of stuff. And then also like um, when you aren't feeling very creative, it's a great way to like fall back on your reference. Yeah. And, and just, at, you know, at some point, if you're just like, OK, I've I'm just not feeling it today, like I don't know how to how to add more to this, then you can just start going back to the reference and picking out characteristics that you think are really cool. And uh, maybe you can try, you know, adding in those into your, in your setup. Yeah. I say? feel like refer reference can definitely save you. Uh, oh yeah. It's awesome. Like, I, yeah. I feel like that's like another thing is like, I, I used to, I used to look up reference, but now I feel like I'm like, 
constantly just it's like almost it's like a lot of, a lot of what i do especially on my off time like um and like for clouds i feel like i do this a lot even though i yeah. haven't really made very good clouds like as a personal project i think that'd be a fun thing to look into um like really good clouds but uh, i would go outside and i'd see a cloud and it's kind of like oh man that's a really good cloud you know yeah I'd yeah take a picture of it so i've just got like a library of clouds <laughs> yeah i do as well and i do a lot of math painting and like photoshop work so i mm -hmm. When I go outside, like people hate me because when they walk with me outside, I'm like shooting the clouds all the time yeah. and I, I keep stopping, every, <laughs> stopping yeah. everybody. Uh, and then, oh yeah. yeah. And then like, that's like the best though, is when you're like, if you've got downtime, you're like sitting waiting for something, I don't know. And you're in a line looking around at all the things that I, I'm like, I get really heady about it where I like look around at all the things and I know, I start noticing like, um, all these small things that mm. you just would never notice like you know just like the way that the wear and tear of the texture of the building is on the ground or like what oh, is yeah. like what is actually at the ground between a building and a sidewalk you know yeah like yeah, what does yeah. that <laughs> what does that mm. look like tiny pieces of grass that are like coming up so yeah i mean like that i feel like yeah just reference and being like aware of stuff and like getting even magic like i feel like also some of the coolest magic that at least in my opinion i've seen is like a really good harmony between the magic and then the environment so like mm -hmm. what is it's cool to see the magic but then also like what is it doing to your environment like how is it affecting things is it creating some kind of like dust i mean there's always going to be something that you know that that's being affected by it so yeah and i feel like a lot of the magic effects are usually based on some sort of reality so even like in harry potter right like their magic wand effects they still have fluid sims and like electricity and it's it it's kind of realistic but you can push it in a way to make it feel magical but still kind of have some real world kind of uh properties right yeah and you can um you can make something that's i mean like lightning is a really good example of it or like electricity which is that mm. They're just they're just lines, you know. Like yeah. that's all they it's are. Noise. Anyway, yeah. But once you once you add in like one of my favorite things about uh, well, let's see this shot right here is that like the lightning looks okay, I guess. But I always just love the interactive lighting between the lightning and the like buildings. You know? Yeah. Like it, it really grounds it. Like they just they they can look very two dimensional um, without like interactivity with the environment. Mm -hmm. um and uh but yeah so i mean i, I think uh, a, a, an aspect to keep in mind with magic is what is it doing to your environment and how can you elevate your magic effect by these extra layers of environment stuff like this engine yeah. for example i feel like one of the things that really sells that is like the expansion and contraction of the the all of the steam around it mm. um kind of helps sell the impact you know secondaries uh, right yeah exactly um but even even more than that you know so um but yeah i think cool. yeah i think it's like really important to to look into that kind of stuff but yeah love it well what do you say if we jump into your project now and maybe we do a few more questions afterwards sure yeah so um in week one this is kind of like one of the effects that we're looking uh that we we create by the end of it um it's mainly about like layering and uh, coming up with procedural solutions to, to mm. things. Um, it's like a very concept heavy week. So it, uh, it's not that much into like actual shot work and, and some of the stuff from the promo, but a lot of this tech is in the electricity and lightning setup. And I think um, there's some of the concepts that I think are like very important, um, at least for how I work. Mm. And yeah, so so this is like the the end end goal setup of the week, and all of this stuff up here is all the concepts we go over throughout the lessons. Um, and uh, and yeah, so one of the things again is like having a setup where um, if you change the input, then it will you don't have there's very little tweaking you have to do to the actual process of it. And um, like another big thing is because we have all these concepts uh, that we're you know kind of copying, we're literally copying and pasting them 
from the concept nodes uh, all the way over to, to the execution of this effect um, and just making some small tweaks. So it's also like those concepts are also stuff that you can like um, save and make HDAs out of uh, and, um, and just kind of keep in your back pocket somewhere to go. It's kind of cool having like a word bank, you know, just to like pull from uh, and, and combine to make, you know, sentences, I guess. Uh, we've got um, all of our concepts that we're going over up here. A lot of really fun stuff, uh, a lot of tips that I think have affected, uh, like I've used uh, yeah. all the time outside of uh, magic even. So um, something that something to consider. And uh, we're going to go over the setup here where we just copy and paste a bunch of these concepts from uh, object level or whatever to this setup and just play around with things. Like this week is mainly about um, just experimenting and getting comfortable with some of the concepts we're gonna be using. Uh, let me see if I can, I can't even hit the play button. <laughs> oh man, this is bad. Are you still recording your screen by the way? Um, yeah, I am. Okay. okay yeah. So for everybody that's watching right now, I'm so sorry <laughs> for this quality. It's going to be better uh, when we are when we upload it to YouTube. But for now, just uh... yeah. Well, let's just let's just look at the this thing and then keep talking. But, um, but yeah, so it's mainly going to be about just making sure that uh, making sure that you're comfortable with the concepts and stuff. And hmm. and we're going to be using those throughout the rest. And then we actually also have like a bunch of other cool things throughout the workshop that we're going to be going over, like. Um, some pretty technical things that I'm going to try to break down pretty, uh, pretty sim simply, which are like, you know, NDC space and stuff, which is really fun to play around with. Um, it's not, uh, there is some, some backs in the workshop, which depending on your comfortability, like I would, I'd be relatively comfortable with backs, although not, you don't have to be that, uh, that into it. And then we're also going to go over like BOP approaches to those. Uh, to that bags. So yeah, I really so I watched uh, week one. I'm one of the lucky ones that can watch the workshop a bit sooner. <laughs> mm. uh, and yeah, I really loved how you explain things and how you are comparing VAX to VOPS and just show comparing it. I feel like a lot of people are so scared of VAX uh, m most of the time, especially if you're not technical or you don't have a programming uh, background. And I love seeing how, like both approaches. I feel like it's super useful for people to learn. Yeah, and I I never had a coding background. I mean, I I think it's f like fun, but mm -hmm. I uh, but I I'm not by any means a professional coder or anything. But I think it's it's nice. It for me at least, some things are easier to to read in Vex, mm -hmm. uh, and then Bops obviously for like noise and stuff. Noise, yeah. yes, exactly. I never do noise in in Vex, never. Even like okay, well, I will say the one thing about Bops that is like such an under undersold. Uh, statement, which is that you can you can really easily make HDAs out of like mm. in in box, um, and that that becomes like a really like nice convenient thing to do. So sometimes I'll even just like do something in Vex, and then I'll recreate it in box just because I want to make an HDA. Like yeah. you can you can make custom functions in Vex and stuff, but it's kind of like annoying, I think, and I think it's just easier to to go into bop, bop land for it. Yeah, I mean it's definitely easier. Like sometimes if I write if my vex is too big, even if I save it, or like I have a a huge library in in I use Notion for all of my documents and kind of to do lists. Mm -hmm. I have one tab just for Houdini. I have a huge list of all the Houdini functions, like vex mm -hmm. functions and snippets. Yeah, and yeah. I even that it became so confusing now that it's sometimes yeah it's a lot easier just to do it in in Vops, save it as a H HDA. It's easier yeah. to read sometimes at a first glance, I feel. Yeah. And, and I, I think it just it just depends on what it is, too. And also what you're comfortable with. Like, you know, some people, I think, are, are really not into VEX, you know? And I, I understand that because it's kind of like uh, very syntax dependent. Like you have to, you know, one mistyped letter can can error it out. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, it's just really quick for me sometimes. So. It just depends on how you like to work. And and by the way, some of the really benefits of these workshops, I think, or in any tutorial and stuff, is that you get to see how people 
how other people work mm -hmm. and like being able to get different perspectives and try things out while you're learning, even if you're in the industry already, like, um, it's great to, to just see how different people, um, accomplish either similar things or other things and, um, incorporate what you, what you like into your own process. And then, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, don't incorporate other, other things. So it just depends on, um, uh, how you like to work. And, but I will say that doing things like this also, it's like a really easy way to do it. Cause all you have to do is sit back and watch. And if you want to do it, you can do it. Um, and just a quick blur about that though, cause I think it's, uh, that was one of the things we were talking about earlier, but I forgot to mention, which is mm -hmm. doing this, these personal projects and like, you know, it depends on what your, what your end goal is. Like if you're a student and you don't, you want to get into visual effects, you know, it's a little bit more important, but I, I think it's, uh, I would just, if you are really interested in something or like if you, um, see an effect that you really like and you want to try to like dig, you know, sink your teeth into it, hmm. that's a perfect time. Like that's when you should just let yourself go wild. Like don't hold back on that because, um, I feel like a lot of times when you're doing like burnout happens, I think when you, hmm. At least for me, it happens when uh, I'm just doing stuff that I'm not really interested in and I'm just doing it all the time. So like pick when it, whenever you do get inspired is like, like allow yourself to, to do that, you know, to go, to go uh, ham on it, so to speak. You mm, know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but, but yeah, so. Yeah. Cool. Can you maybe <laughs> try uh, going through the setup one more time? Just yeah. like explaining can... the basic, like the uh, bits and pieces. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm just trying to go back to when you said that, you know, every person has a different way of working. So if you can maybe explain like your thought process when you go uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. like this. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. So when you have your input, like a, a curve, um, you mm -hmm. might get it from another artist or you might, um, hit yourself. Um, then you just do a bunch of procedural, uh, get, essentially you gather up every, all the information that you, uh, need or, um, for the, for the effect and put all mm -hmm. of your kind of, um, everything that you essentially just try to see what you can get procedurally from something. So maybe I might even in this like area drop like a measure just to always have the length stored. Um, mm -hmm. and then you can always go back and like delete things that you never needed. Once, like, if you're in the if you're in the moment, you're trying to create something, then I'll, oftentimes I'll just punch down a bunch of attribute things that I may or may not need later, just so I have them available and I don't have to interrupt, like the artistic kind of flow, I guess, of uh, mm -hmm. of actually creating it. And then this is where I add a bunch of noise or a little bit of noise, and um, this is something we this is a, a vop that we actually create in the concepts uh, mm -hmm. section of the of the lesson and um and then this for loop just repeats it and twirls all of the uh the strands around the central one and then you can do a bunch of like i think one of the really cool things that you can do to pilot a bunch of procedural things is actually just using age and creating like an age in a life for uh each of the strands for example um and then you can animate based off of that so you could even, so then if, for example, you didn't create your own strands, but you did something procedural with a, like a pop net, then you could pilot all of the animation that you have later with age and life. Um, so it's a really neat way of like creating a lot of variation and creating a lot of animation based off of this, like normalized, uh, zero to one kind of time ramp that you can mm -hmm. get from age and life. So I just create age and life here. And then this is, see, I wish I could hit play. Just press uh, the up arrow key. Oh yeah, there you go. So this is where, so yeah, so we uh, have a bunch of, of these strands starting to animate through, but we haven't deleted anything yet. Mm -hmm. Because once you've deleted something, then you're kind of locking yourself. Like I could at any point, I could create some kind of deformer and deform this so that all of the paths are now different. But if I start deleting things and things could start popping, um, I just I, I, I try to, to work uh, non-destructively while mm -hmm. I'm doing these kinds of effects. And then at the very end, if I need to, to, 
delete things I can. Um, or you could just, you know, use alpha or, or width or something. Yeah. Um, and then right here, I'm just using, this is actually just alpha and, and width. And um, I don't know why, the, no, I feel like I've never, uh, it took a long time for me to realize this, but okay, wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> There's a shade open curve option in display that when you mm -hmm. enable that, and then if you enable it on the actual object level node, then you can actually see the width of lines pretty clearly mm -hmm. um, in the viewport, which is really nice. Mm -hmm. um, and then we just duplicated this setup over here and created uh, just a couple different parameters and created uh, and then rasterized this as a volume. Um, so you get this like vortex smoke kind of thing. Yep. Um, and then just as a uh, an extra little detail, um, you can add some noise just for lack of wanting to put that much thought into it at the time and just drop mm -hmm. a cloud of noise, which gets some really cool um, results. And then in H19, I think they introduced the volume noise fog, which you can use as well to get some more variation. Yeah. Um, and then over here, we've got the same, again, the exact same setup, just with less lines. Mm -hmm. And um, I created, uh, scattered a bunch of points and deformed them back onto the lines. Mm -hmm. And then we, we go over like parametric UVs in the course, but uh, you can use an app attribute interpolate to move these points along those lines. So yeah. you can get, you, and you can vary the speed and everything like that, which is pretty Yeah, cool. see, I love that. See, that's what I'm saying, that you're, you're creating an illusion of simulation but you're just moving points. Yeah, from exactly. Zero to one space. Yeah. And they actually, it's funny because they, when they loop, they snap back and yeah. they create these crazy velocities. And we, there's, we're going to go later in the workshop how to like deal with that in a better way. But yeah. again, because we're just in this lesson, just trying to go over the concepts and like being comfortable with them, mm -hmm. we uh, just deleted the, uh, <laughs> the high velocity points and stuff. But you know, like when mm -hmm. you're just getting, getting through it, you can do things like that. Yeah. Um, and then we uh, randomized some scale up here uh, using like an exponential um, method or whatever. And then these are then mesh lights, which you're not gonna be able to see this, I, I don't think, but mm. these are then mesh lights for the, uh, for the volume. And, and, mm -hmm. and then another thing that you can do um, is for this volume, I wanted it to illuminate, but mesh lights can be kind of render expensive. So um, you can convert these guys into a volume and use that as like your emission volume. Mm. And then you can do shade, you know, use that in shading yeah. in Arnold or Modular yeah. or whatever. Yeah. So, so yeah, that's kind of uh, the basics that we go through and uh, the kind of final product. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's a pretty, pretty fun week, I think. Love it. I love how how you combine different layers that by themselves look simple, but then start adding it together. And also I, I always <clears throat> think every VFX artist should know how to comp because a lot of that effect that comes, you know, a lot of that magical glare and flaring comes from comp, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And keeping yeah. a, at least keeping a, a good idea of what they can do in comp. Yeah. It's a really good, it's a really good thing to keep in mind because, mm -hmm. um, and then, and then you can also do like a thing where you render out a few frames and then try to comp it and then go do like a back and forth. Um, just because, uh, at some point you want to build things back into your renders so that if anybody picks it up, then they can start kind of where you left off and then improve it. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. But you can do so many different. You can do. You can get so many different looks with just this kind of thing. Like I, I did this, but you'll see. You'll see once you get kind of more comfortable with the concepts. I would veer from this and just do mm -hmm. some great stuff that you just thought of, you know. And I like this format of just like a little tiny strand that's just like energetic and stuff that you yeah. can um, that you can kind of experiment with and just kind of like get used to that layering that you do in effects. Um, Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's the cool. first week. Love it. Yeah, I think it's great. And I love it that <laughs> actually the, the promo itself looks awesome, but there's actually way more effects that you're going to be, you know, teaching yeah, and, and, and like, be learning. That, those are the base, the basics, like the thrusters, for example, there's not a sim 
in that. There's like yeah. not even a single one. Yeah. Um, and a lot of those con like a, I use a lot of these concepts in the thruster tech. Mm -hmm. So um, and then I add some and like think in week kind of around week three is when we're going to try to actually look at these shots. But the first two weeks are just me about building tech and being comfortable with concepts and mm -hmm. experimenting around. And, you know, I would just recommend that anybody who's taking it um, really just tries to experiment and not necessarily be doing exactly what I'm doing. Um, um, but anyways, yeah, cool. I think All we're right. almost out of time, actually. Yeah, I was just about to say, I want to be mindful of your time. I know you have to get back to work <laughs> to make some more magic <laughs> happen. Um, yeah. yeah, I just have like one last question, I guess. Yeah. How do you stay, how do you stay sharp? Like, how do you train uh, your, your brain and your, your CG and VFX brain? Yeah, I think it's just keep like, like look things up. I mean, uh, yeah, just anytime you see an effect that you like, dig into it, you know, uh, Google a bunch of stuff. And, um, I follow a lot of the like, uh, FX artist or yeah, Houdini artists or something like that on Facebook and LinkedIn mm -hmm. and stuff. And just seeing everyone else's work makes me really enthusiastic. Yeah. And so when you're enthusiastic about it, you'll naturally look things up and mm. be interested and, in. and like, you know, um, I love scouring YouTube for like, technical like they're like have you ever seen that two minute paper channel mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like that stuff's awesome you know it's yeah. just like it's just like technical stuff that like kind of piques your interest enough for you to look into it yeah like i was just looking at like oh man there's like something i was looking into recently it was like slime algorithms or something like that it's just <laughs> i just went on like a deep hole of like two nights in a row just looking up like this slime thing yeah but it's just about i think it's about having fun and like, if you like allowing yourself to look into things that you're interested in, if that mm -hmm. makes sense, yeah. like, um, you don't need to hold yourself back. <laughs> um, I think a lot of people are, are fearful of like it, burnout. And so they try to pace it and stuff. And I think you should be fearful of burnout, but, um, but when you're interested, I don't think that usually, um, uh, cultivates burnout. Yeah. If it, if it comes from a place of love. It's yeah, like easier. a passion, passionate, <laughs> yeah. kind of thing, an artistic thing. Yeah. I think mainly when burnout happens is when you think you need to be doing it. You're like, mm -hmm. oh, I should, I should be practicing right now, you know, as opposed to like actually just loving what you're looking at and being like, oh man, it'd be so cool if I did this. And then if you're not feeling it, like if you get into it and you start not feeling it, then just go take a walk, you know, do something else. You can all, like, I think there's, it's all about getting into that like zone, at least for me. Um, yeah. Cool. Cool. I think I think I think that's a perfect way to end this. <laughs> yeah, if you yeah. if anybody has any questions, feel free to reach out on Discord and I'll see what I can do about responding and getting you all the information exactly. you need. Cool. Well, Hunter, thank you very much for for the amazing workshop and for the webinar. I think it's amazing. It's great. Yeah. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. Cool. Well, Thanks everybody for joining us. That's all we have for you today. I hope you learned something new and are excited for the new workshop. See you soon. And remember, once a rebel, always a rebel. Bye.